All right, guys, so this is the uh, second video in the uh, ethics kind of video series. And in this video, we're gonna cover the, the, the questions that you'll see that have those question marks of kind of like, what would you tell a patient? What would be the most appropriate uh, kind of comment back to them? And kind of how you wanna approach those or how I approach them was thinking, okay, despite sometimes what I wanna say, there's probably the more appropriate thing to say, which is what they're looking for. And I always imagined myself kind of with a, like an observer in the room that was there kind of determining whether I would get into residency or not. So I'm always looking for the most politically correct thing to say, the most neutral statement um, that kind of makes the patient feel heard and such, uh, but always kind of approach it from that angle and you, and you really can't go wrong because a lot of times you want to, you know, you want to kind of say, well, this is what I would say in real life, but don't do that. Um, and then at the very end, we'll go over just some quick statements about like uh, how you'd handle the HIV, uh, some other informed consent stuff. And then we have a couple other questions in between that I think will be beneficial. So this is what I got for the ethics and uh, let me know how, how it went for you on this. Uh, leave a comment and if there's any more topics that you'd like, uh, just let us know. All right, guys. So here's the second part of the uh, ethics videos. And, you know, you'll see these these one with quotes uh, a, a lot, especially on, on the exam. But you when you get these on your test, I mean, this is a good thing because these should be, should be pretty easy. It says a 42 year old man comes to the comes to his physician after three days of burning urination. He acknowledges having an extramarital affair. His partner, who is also a patient of yours contacts contacts the office and is inquiring about the, res, the recent test results. She states, "Can you let me know if my husband will be okay? What will be your most appropriate response? Is it A? Uh, I recommend you schedule an appointment for examination. Is it B? What specific question would you like to know? Is it C? I think you and your husband should discuss this matter first. D? I'll I'll need your husband's permission before discussing anything with you." Or is it E? Everything will be fine. Every, everything has a way of working, its, working itself out. Now, you know, it says that, you know, this, this lady is also a patient uh, of that doctor's, but at the end of the day, you know, at the end of the day, end of the day you, you know, you got to don't violate HIPAA, even if the person's married, you got to get the patient's permission. So in this case, um, you, you would tell her, I, you know, I'll need your husband's permission before discussing anything with you. But again, you know, how I approach how I approach these is like I said in that intro is, you know, if, if I was, if I was in the room with this patient and there were, you know, and, and there were two people next to me who, who didn't say a word, but they were there, you know, kind of assessing me and, and my getting into residency dependent on it, you know, I would do the, you know, do the right thing. Uh, and so a lot of times when you see these, these questions, you know, it's like, you want to say, well, this is what I probably would do. But in the, at the end of the day, you got to do what's the, the ethical uh, principle, and you don't want to violate HIPAA, and so you, you do answer choice D. But if you stick with this kind of concept, uh, you'll get pretty much all these types of questions uh, correct on the real exam. This one says, an 84-year-old woman hospitalized for two days with diabetic ketoacidosis now refuses insulin injections. She feels that her medical state has deteriorated to the point where she wishes no longer to keep going. She is essentially blind and will most likely require bilateral leg amputations. She used to be a dancer and does not see happiness in her current state. Psychiatric consultation was placed and patient has capacity of, of, of about refusing care. She states, my mind is made up. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step in the patient's care? Now, you know, a lot of this stuff when they say what's the next step, you know, that's kind of a, you know, a lot of times step you know, step two is really big. Step two and three are really big and, you know, what's the next step of care. But when it comes to these ethics questions, you know, this kind of applies to even step one. So you have this really old lady, um, you know, she's refusing medications and you already got a psych consult and they said that she has capacity and, you know, th these are her wishes. So, so, so what do you do? Okay. Do you A, declare a medical emergency and give the patient insulin until they uh, competency evaluation can be done? Is it B, reconsult psychiatry for possible admission? C, have a legal guardian appointed? D, discharge patient against medical advice? Or E, offer the insulin, though allow patient to refuse? Well, whenever you see the word, again, competency, is, this has nothing to do with the physician. That is going to be a legal term and only a, oops, only a judge can determine that. So when I see this word, I don't get too excited at all in any of my answer choices. Reconsult psychiatry, well, if you did that, as they say, a lot of times the consultation choice is never 
or, or most of the time not a good answer choice on any of the exams because they're testing your knowledge about whether you know what to do. You're not going to say reconsults uh, per se somebody as a next step in the treatment unless you, know, unless you were getting a capacity, but the capacity was already done. So, you know, she's not crazy because they've already said that she has the ability to make an informed decision. So it's not going to be that guy. Have a legal guardian appointed. Again, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get this if the patient has the capacity. Discharge patient against medical advice. Well, you know, it's not like you're just going to, again, this goes back to what's the right thing to do. Uh, e, offer insulin that allow the patient to refuse. It's like you're still doing the right thing, and then she has a choice. And as long as you can document that she has the capacity to make that choice, I mean, that's the, that's the key piece of this whole puzzle right there, that she has the capacity. So as long as she has that, you can, the right thing to do is to offer it and then allow her to refuse it. So we answer choice E, okay? But look for the capacity, and then again, go back to you got to do, do what the right thing is, and I always do that little the, the, that thing of just if I had two people with me who did who determined whether I got into residency or not and they didn't say a word, I'd be on my you know best behavior and I would always do the do the right thing. This one says a 32 year old female who was a frequent flyer to your primary care office with 10 visits over the past three months with a multitude of complaints. Current concern is low back pain. She reports that that pain that the pain has been ongoing for the past three days. Lab work as well as physical findings on neurological orthopedic examination are unremarkable. She has no history of other, any other major illnesses. When told of her exam findings, the patient becomes very irritated and demands that she have an MRI of her low back or that she will sue the doctor uh, and hospital for malpractice. She states that her insurance company will pay for the test. The patient requests the physician to order an MRI and that you document data that would support the testing, which, which of the following is the most appropriate action of the physician. Now again, when it comes to the ethics, you're going to get these questions on the step exams. Uh, so in this one, again, do the right thing. Is it A, advise the patient that if she can convince her insurance company to approve the, to, up to basically to approve the exam, that there would be no issue with ordering it, this through her primary care provider? Is it B? Uh, explain that the MRI is not necessary and it's unethical to document inaccurate findings. Okay, maybe, right? It's the right thing. We'll continue through these. Order the MRI and tell the patient that it may or may not be paid for as the documentation may not support warranting the examination. Um, you know, in real life, that'll probably come up, uh, but I don't know. It's like you're kind of, uh, you, you know, you're trying to, you're focusing on the wrong thing, essentially. Is it D, recommend out-of-pocket payment for the imaging study? You know, that's most like you want to, what you'd want to tell this person. It's like, hey, you know, you gotta, you know, you're just wasting the time. There's, no, there's, 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 you know, you get, you got this history of coming in, and you know, kind of like you don't want to support her, her little habit here, or kind of endorse, especially when there's no, when there's no uh, physical findings on this. So, but you're really not going to do that, and you're not going to say call your insurance and if you, and if they'll approve it, I'll do it, because the insurance company is going to be like, what are you talking about? That just makes no sense. Um, the correct answer in this one is you're going to explain that it's not necessary and it's unethical, okay? It's not necessary and unethical. And they call this, really, this is going to be what they call futile uh, treatment. And this falls under that category where um, that there's really no evidence or rationale for the treatment, okay? And that kind of fits this scenario. Or, you know, whether treatment has failed in the past, um, and so it's like, well, look, if it didn't work in the past, then, then you know, it doesn't make sense just to keep, keep doing it and, and doing it. Uh, it's like ordering an MRI that was justified and then saying, look, I want another one, and it's like a week later and there's been no new findings. Um, or that they tried the max intervention and it failed. You know, so there's, there's no reason to kind of do something less than that. Um, so, yeah, this is under the heading of futile treatment. So again, answer choice B, not necessary, and it would be unethical. This one reads, a 30-year-old woman reaches out to a resident physician and asks him if he would like to come to dinner with her on a date. The resident met this patient while he was assigned to her care during a recent hospitalization for a major depressive disorder. I say recent, but it has been 10 months since the admission. The uh, resident did not reach out or initiate contact with this patient which of the following is the most appropriate action by the resident physician regarding the patient's dinner invitation? Okay, so this goes in the, into the whole thing of the doctor, 
you know, patient, and when I say relationship, it's the outside the hospital relationship, if there is one or if there can be one. So in this situation, is it A, since it has been one year since admission and they did not have a doctor-patient relationship during that time of the, of the well, I say it's been 10 months, not one year, um, it would be appropriate to initiate a relationship? Okay. And is it B, the customary time in the situation to not have a doctor-patient relationship is 12 months, therefore it would be inappropriate to have a relationship until that time? So it's saying it's 10 months, you've got to wait 12. Hmm. Is it C, inappropriate as the patient was a psychiatric patient? That's looking pretty good. Or is it D, he can date her as long as he signs the agreement to not, as long as she signs the agreement to not be treated under his care or in any, or in the care of any facility in which he works? Okay, well... You know, a lot of these are kind of like, well, you know, if you don't know the answer, you're kind of like, well, it's possible, right? Well, the fact is, the key point on this one, okay, the key point on this one is going to be, you know, she was in the hospital for major depression. So she was a psychiatric patient. And I can tell you that if, if it's a psychiatric patient and it's, it's some type of mental health, especially if you're a psychiatrist, you can never, you know, never have a relationship, no matter what time frame it is, with any of the patients. Um, so that's just a, a, a just a fact. Um, obviously, there can be some you know, obviously some uh, you know you know it's like you know too much from that from that perspective of the patient. So it is absolutely um, forbidden per se. Now uh, there's some literature out there that says if you're not if you were in a, in a different field you have to you know if this didn't say that she was um, a, a psychiatric patient. I think the, you know, kind of the theme that's been out there is, and I say theme, it's the stuff that's in, in the study guides, is that you have to end the relationship. It has to be established that, the, that there is no doctor-patient relationship, and that has ended, um, and then you could, uh, you know, proceed. And I, I do not believe there is a time frame. If someone knows anything different, put it in the comment section, and, and if I check it and it's accurate, I'll put it as a pin up top. But if it's a psychiatric patient, the answer is never, never, never. Um, if it's uh, a non-psychiatric patient, you have to end the doctor-patient relationship uh, firmly established. Okay? And then this one says, 37-year-old man returns to his orthopedist for follow-up examination. Approximately six months ago, he underwent repair for ligament damage to his knee. After recent exercise routine, the patient injured his knee and re-injured tore the ligament. The patient is upset and feels that the physician did not do a good job during the original procedure. Which of the following is the most likely precipitating factor in this patient's decision to file a mal malpractice lawsuit? So, malpractice lawsuit. So they're saying, you know, which of these is a reason why why people typically sue? Is it because the physician was incompetent? Well, maybe. Um, is it the patient's socioeconomic status? No, there's no data to support that. Um, the physician's lack of understanding of the patient's extracurriculars before and after procedure. Um, you know, it's not typically that's going to be the reason why they're going to think, hey, you know, you didn't do a, a good enough, you didn't, before you did the procedure, you should have known that I was going to go out and play, uh, you know, ride a bike or play ball again. Uh, that's not part of it. Is it the physician's experience with this procedure? No, typically that's known on, on, the, on the front end, not, not classically the decision to file a lawsuit. Is it E, the perception that the physician is uncaring? And that's going to be the one. That's when, you know, it's been, you know, the data shows that if you, you know, if you talk to the patient, if you, um, I say talk to the patient, but what I mean by that is if you go the extra mile to explain, if you, if you make a mistake that you own up to it, uh, if you make sure that something, if something negative happened, that you reached out to family all throughout, you know, it's proven that if they, if, if the family hears your voice, that they are less likely um, to pursue any type of legal action. So the main precipitant for malpractice is the perception that the physician is uncaring. So take that concept. So when you get questions on your step exam, just remember, go with the answer choice that, that obviously is where the, where the doctor is, is, is more, um, I won't say concerned, but there's a lot of buy-in with the patient care. Uh, but just make sure you go with that one, okay? Now, some other last little tidbits for the ethics session is... Uh, you know, always inform patients of mistakes, okay? They'll always ask you that, like, you know, if, even if they give you a question where you have the opportunity to kind of cover it up, per se, 
always do the right thing. Always admit your mistake. Um, even when you're in residency, uh, they have like a. They'll always tell you there's a, you can you, there's near misses and there's all these type of things. You always want to make sure that you you say something. If you gave the wrong medication, you know, make sure that you tell the patient that about what happened. You got to own up to it. Okay, and that um, the other another point is family cannot um, require a doctor to uh, withhold information um, to the patient without their consent. Okay, when I say their consent, I mean the patient's consent. So, you know, if, if, if grandpa's got cancer, the family can't come to you and say, please don't tell him, please don't tell him, it's going to make things worse. You know, you can't, you can't really withhold that because the family wants it. You got to tell the patient about that. Uh, some other stuff is when it comes to like uh, the HIV uh, class, that uh, the, if, if the physician is positive, um, that you don't have to tell. You don't have to um, let it be known that you have that. Okay, so you can keep that to yourself, even if you're a surgeon. And then confidentiality, it goes back to that when we talked about confidentiality can be broken if there is danger. And when I say danger, when it comes to this, is like, uh, you know, sexual partners, People who share uh, needles and stuff like that. Okay, that, that if that if this if the person who's positive is not you know if there's danger to their sex partners or the or needle that you're, you're aware of, that that's when confidentiality can confidentiality can be broken, and then you know a doctor can refuse treatment of HIV uh, patient. You know you can refuse treatment to any patient. You have that you have that right. It's and the key with that is it's not it's not illegal, but it's unethical. Okay? It's not illegal, but it's unethical. And probably the last thing I would say it comes down to pregnant women. You know, when it comes to an ethics issue on that, pregnant women can can refuse treatment even if it puts the fetus at risk, okay? So a pregnant woman can refuse treatment even if it puts the fetus at risk. It's basically recognized that um, until the child comes out uh, that it's part of the woman's body and so it's her decision. So the pregnant woman holds all the cards uh, when it comes to that until the child comes out. So these are just a couple extra little points um, that should cover most of the ethics stuff. But again, treat it as though you're in a room with a couple people watching and always just, just do the right thing. And I think you'll kind of fly through these questions. So hope this helps.